Hello and welcome to the Farmer Forum Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Comstock. I'm joined today by Eugene Barukovic. Uh, he's the COO of Your Coach Health, but he's also the host of DTX Podcast on Digital Health Today. And he's here today because we're going to be talking about DTX, which is Digital Therapeutics, and the DTX East Conference in Boston, where the two of us were earlier this week. Welcome to the show, Eugene. Thank you. And uh, it was great to see you in 3D and in flesh. Um, so always, always much better, even though we've been interacting over uh, virtual channels for, for a while. Absolutely. And, and it's, um, it's exciting to have you here because I, I dip my toe into DTX. Uh, and obviously, it relates to sort of my old beat of digital health. But I'm not as immersed in it as you are talking to the, the movers and shakers in that space uh, all the time for your podcast. Um, so I'll be excited to hear some of your impressions and maybe just to start, what were some of your overall impressions from the show? Yeah. Uh, well, before I jump into the impressions, actually, it's funny. I said this on the DTX podcast that, uh, I'm just, or, or as Dan Kendall, digital health today calls me, I'm the talent that talks to the amazing entrepreneurs that are actually building this, uh, on the front lines and are having the challenges and everything from reimbursements to, you know, engagement and activation and outcomes. So, uh, I'm a conduit and for lack of a better term, a historian of the DTX, um, with, with this podcast. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because while I am connected to you know many of the entrepreneurs and the leaders in the space, uh, I'm not the one that's feeling the pain on the front lines. So my, I, I guess I, I would almost describe this, and I'm sure we'll dive deeper into it um, uh, on on two ends of that spectrum. On one side, uh, the two key takeaways for me was that unfortunately, you know, on stage and off stage, some of the uh, lessons learned and the failures and some of the challenges that are being seen in the marketplace on uh, specifically on the PDT side have turned into people more privately talking smack about each other's data, talking smack about, you know, why this particular channel is better than others um, versus, uh, and I've heard this say many times on, on, on the pan, on the panels is, you know, a tide raises all the boats, right? Um, and this industry is really only roughly about a decade old. Uh, so in the scheme of us improving health and care for, you know, century plus and FDA, I think was formed sometime in early 1900. I don't quote me on it. We can, we can look, look that up for the notes. Um, this is nothing. Decade is nothing. So that's one thing I think, unfortunately, people are taking this extremism of, oh crap, uh, you know, DTX is dead, right? On one side of it. On the other side, I think, uh, you know, there's, Really great evidence at this point um, out there, right? And of course, it depends on the clinical studies, depends on the company that's that's doing it. And there is traction in the marketplace, right? Um, and I think kind of celebrating some of those wins is a key component of this that many individuals on stage and off stage also express. So this dichotomy of of the opinions of where the DTX industry is going. Yeah, I think that's well said. And and by the way, you talked about uh, private to uh, smack talking, but there was smack talking happening right up on stage, I thought, here and there, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I caught maybe just one of those. I, I think you were probably uh, uh, listening to many more panels than I have been uh, just catching up in private. But uh, but yeah, that that's an interesting observation. Cal Patel from Bright Insight, who I did a video interview with, which hopefully, if the sound turned out, will be going up on Farmer Forum. We did it outside, so it's a little dodgy. Um, made a comparison, both in our conversation and on stage, to the dot-com boom. You know, basically the idea that, like, the promise is there. This is the way things are going. Like, the internet is not going away, and neither are digital therapeutics. But, you know, it, some people have figured out how to do it the right way. And other people are are embarking on experiments that are not going to work out. Um, and, and so it's just a question of sort of positioning yourself to come out of it as one of the winners. And that's what everybody's talking about is, is what does that entail? And all these other debates about prescription versus over the counter, you know, who you're, what's the commercial model, who are you selling to? Those are sort of like about figuring out the model that's going to it's going to really emerge when the smoke clears. 
so I, I think generally, I absolutely agree with Cal. Uh, you know, I think the overarching market dynamics, you know, while different, uh, I think part of the dot com bust, I mean, a lot of money went into uh, a lot of vaporware. And I would not pick on the DTX specifically as a sub industry. I think broader kind of digital health, but even if you look at it even broader, it doesn't matter whether it's healthcare uh, or e-commerce, uh, you know, I think the funding has dried up across the board. This is just macroeconomic. Um, now, as an as entrepreneurs out there, of course, the market conditions are tough, right? Um, there is and will continue to be a graveyard, and let's focus back into the DTX solutions. You know, we as your coach are still a relatively young company, and this is more in the health coaching industry. Almost every week, we get an email in, would you like to buy our assets, something in health coaching, right? Um, so I think we've seen this across. Um, I do think this will be Darwinism and the comment about, uh, you know, surviving, you know, my sort of favorite statement these days is you need to survive in order to thrive, right? Um, and I think uh, Eddie actually, uh, Martucci said this on on one of the last closing panels, is around it comes down to really unit economics, right? And many more entrepreneurs you're talking with these days is, well, how do you become at least cash flow positive um, as soon as possible? And I'm not talking about, you know, margin positive, right? Um, so I, I think... Again, overall, I absolutely agree with Cal. I think uh, there will be many companies that the strongest will survive. There is no one model. You know, my only kind of a little bit of a, I would say, count, I, don't, I don't even say a counter argument. It's just uh, when you when you are doing the prescription digital therapeutics, it is complex, right? It is stuck between a SAMD or a medical device uh, and a molecular go-to-market um, way of doing things. So it does take about a decade to commercialize and get to market. Um, and I just don't see many new startups getting funded in the PDT space, right? Yeah, there is a lot of overhead. And I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, but before we do, I want to talk about Pear. Uh, obviously, that was the elephant in the room. And I don't even know if it's right to call it an elephant in the room because people were talking about it. People were talking about it yeah. openly, constantly. Everybody had a take. It's interesting you said, you know, it, it's about unit economics and, and being cash flow positive. One of the takeaways people seem to have about Pear was this notion that maybe it's a bad thing to get too much investment in a space where the returns are going to take a long time because then you have this pressure from your investors to turn it around quickly. And there was definitely a suggestion, and I, I can't remember exactly who this came from, so I won't put it in anyone's mouth specifically, that that's what happened with Pear and that, uh, and that that's a lesson that uh, companies can learn, you know, is to be a, a camel, not a unicorn, you know, to focus on being sustainable on the long yeah. game, on surviving, rather than trying to be you know, a billion dollar company and, and a smash hit. Yeah. Look, um, hindsight is always 2020, right? Uh, always. Um, and so I think from, uh, what I don't appreciate actually, and, and this is both to your point, maybe I, I haven't heard on, on the stage, but, uh, but certainly in, in the, in, in, in private discussions, there is a lot of smack talking, um, um, on everything from data of pair. And again, I, I, personally have not reviewed it, so I, I, I kind of don't want to speak to it. Um, you know, the financial st uh, situation, um, you know, spending and overspending or underspending. I think the whole market got spoiled and Pear just happened to kind of take in the cash at the same time as many others have taken in the cash for the quote unquote war chest to bring the hypothesis of a uh, reimbursable prescription digital therapeutic, right? And so if you take an, a regular molecule that takes a decade and a billion plus, and I think the number is now almost 2 billion, right? If, if not more, depending on the molecule to market, then that hypothesis, if held true and that succeeded, it would have been a success story. It just, it just didn't did not end that way, right? Um, so I think from a lesson learned per perspective, I think all entrepreneurs now have adjusted to the fact that spend when you need to spend, what you need to spend, and take in the amount of money that you need to get to the next proof point, if you even need it, 
right? Uh, just in the last week, I've had so many discussions, uh, and actually not even interested in digital health entrepreneurs, but you know, bootstrapping, right? Getting to a certain point um, of uh, now again more difficult with prescription digital therapies, right? Because you do need that R and D cash um, to bring stuff to market. So, in, in summary, I would. I would say, and, and I think actually Andy Molnar made a great, great point in that last panel as well, um, that millions and millions of dollars that Pear spent on, um, you know, in Washington, D.C., that actually did pave the way of what's happening now in some of the hearings, right? So, unfortunately, that money doesn't flow back to them in a concrete way, but it does. No, it, it absolutely does not, right? Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit on the list of, of topics I gave you because there's a good segue here to pharma partnerships, right? Pair had that partnership with, uh, I believe it was Otsuka. Um, you know, th- there have been a few that we've gotten very excited about, and then they haven't uh, turned out so exciting. Um, you know, you're looking back to, to Proteus, a lot of interesting conversations I had about, is pharma even a good partner for DTX? And, and if so, when is pharma a good partner? And and again, it comes down to to scale and unit economics, right? This idea that like the the whole budget of a DTX company is a rounding error. That was Schwen Gui, I think, who said that um, to a pharma budget. And your cent- incentives are not going to be aligned unless you have some kind of wraparound product that improves revenues on a per drug sale basis, some kind of adherence play. But if you have a standalone digital therapeutic, pharma seems to be showing itself to be a partner that you just can't count on because they're, the scale you're working on is not impactful to them in any way. That was the argument I heard. I heard that from uh, Chris Wasden uh, and and I think a little bit from, from Cal too, although his may have been a little more nuanced. He does, in fact, work with uh, pharma partners at Bright Insight. No, listen, I- indeed, right? And and honestly, even when I was still at Big Pharma, uh, uh, I think Sven and I were kind of in sync on, it's it's just rounding errors, right, on the overarching R&D budgets in general, right? And we actually seen uh, somewhat of a decimation of these digital innovation teams, um, which also kind of rewinding back, uh, the hypothesis, at least in my mind, was always that these centralized team need to be able to disappear and disappear quickly, that a lot of ways to work and, and you know understanding the market and driving the market really needs to be embedded into the organization, which, you know, the question is, has that actually happened? Or, you know, the recent example of Biogen shutting down the 150 person organization purely for say cost savings, right? Obviously, just given where Biogen is. Um, so, Which I should point out was not discussed at the conference because the news broke literally yes. on the last day of the conference. <laughs> so look, um, you know, the example you made, Proteus, uh, I think those are very, very different reasons. You know, I think when you need to change your supply chain and the way you get the actual pills to market, that's a very different reason for kind of the company hypothesis and and the shutdown and or the assets being purchased uh um i think when it comes to standalone um i am very much and i think i've been saying this from almost the beginning uh to when uh, the team at the time we joined the digital therapeutic alliance as a standalone you will never be able to charge some of the premiums that the molecular drugs do right especially in the specialty space and let's face it for the top let's say even 10 or even top 20 pharma Unless you have something like between, you know, 25, 50 million and up in revenues, um, it's just not interesting. It's it's just not, right? Um, and look at any of the digital health businesses that's been spun up. How many can you name that are doing more than 50 million a year in revenue, right? So I'm not even talking about DTX. Now, I do still think that pharma is a great partner because again there's the scientific rigor uh which you know one would argue many of the personnel that that left pharma went to dtx and might be returning back right with that experience in the startup world and however i think the final piece to this is while it might have some outcome improvements right and again i'm not going to pick on any dtx products that are can work in conjunction with the molecules but it's also the real world data that pharma needs to defend their pricing ultimately right um and so if they can improve by even a small percentage point the outcomes you know pill does its thing plus let's call it 
mental health related or other surrounding even biological impacts via software, great, you're collecting the data, you're justifying the either increase in pricing or at least staying put in pricing. Um, that's the use cases. I agree. I don't see many pharma um, you know, really going strong on standalone digital therapies. The other piece I think is that it, it's one thing to say like, uh, we'd love a pharma partnership. A pharma partnership will help us develop and advance our, our product. And it's another thing to say like, a pharma partnership is our commercial strategy. It's our it's our be all and end all. Once we get in the door with pharma, then we're, you know, we're golden. I think we're definitely learning that that latter is is not a good way to think about it. But as you say, you know, if your interests are aligned when it comes to evidence generation, then that can be a win win partnership. Um, but you've got to be looking to see what do you do after that. You know. <laughs> yeah, and look, and, and again, very transparent. I think David Kleinman. I mean, that's been. Their strategy from day one, not standalone. It's the partnerships with pharma. Um, you know, I would say even Achille, right? Eddie has some partnerships. I I don't don't remember off the top of my head um, with pharma, right? So I think uh, again, that's going to continue to be so. Um, I would almost argue that pharma is also uh, you know a great partner for many of the talents that unfortunately has been laid off and bring some of those skills in. Uh, back in house to start driving a lot of these and and some of the assets that could be frankly bought for pennies in the dollar now right uh, from that perspective as well, so I I think we'll start seeing probably a bit more co- quote unquote competition with DTX companies that are trying to partner up with pharma um, and some of the efforts that potentially pharma can be driving almost directly right. You could almost break a lot of the other conversation at the event into different buckets of sort of stakeholders that you could partner with in addition to pharma. There was a lot of conversation about working with payers and employers as a as a path to um, commercialization. Um, we had Twill sharing the stage with Amazon, talking about how they've worked together. And we had Sidekick and Elevance Health talking about how they've worked together. Um, and, and that's a very ambitious payer partnership. <laughs> um, and and so th- this does seem like a bright spot. It seems like the the companies that are that are working this way, uh, we're you know we're there to share kind of success stories, at least in terms of uh, broad implementation, and, and if not in terms of you know having results to share yet of, of how this improved populations. So first of all, I mean I think the employer. Uh, and pay models have been there, right? Um, you know, many, if if I switch gears, while you know ultimately there's a payer above, but you know even the pharmacy benefit managers that are under the you know the bigger kind of brands Cigna and others and CVS, they've had digital formularies now. I think the challenge is just differ because while you can be on the formulary, while you could have a a, a you know, a contract with a large employer or a health plan, um, it's always about that activation and then ultimately the engagement. So again, on one side, it's the reimbursement um, and the lack thereof. And even if you do, it's how do you disperse those prescriptions, right? How do you make doctors aware of them? So the numbers are, you know, small and growing. Um, on the other side is the challenge of the employer. But again, that's actually, I, I think, you know, if we look at somebody like Big Health, who really flipped that model very quickly, going from kind of the direct to consumer within the UK towards the employers, um, they've been, again, I don't know the outcomes to your point, um, or the financials, even though I think Brian, uh, our friend Brian Dolan have published some stuff and some hypotheses for, for the revenues for these private players. Um, you know, for full transparency, we are partners with Twill. Um you know, servicing Amazon and other populations uh, through Twill. Um, and so I think it's actually that combination that we're starting to see that the standalone, um, you know, yes, self-paced, but scientifically proven tools to enable access. Um, that's the other underlying sort of theme that I've witnessed. And maybe because we're running a coaching company, but a lot of the conversation has been that there still needs to be a human in the loop. And even if it the human does not need to be there in the loop per se, right? I mean, Twill is a standalone. I can use it myself. We as human beings want to lean on another person. So that human in the loop is important and clinical care is not always available, right? So I think those models will continue 
improving. Um, I think those activation and back to, you know, there will be a graveyard of some of these companies that have been selling to employers as well. Therefore, some companies such as Twill, Big Health, and many others will be taking larger shares of those populations, figuring out how to activate, how to engage, how to bring that human in the loop, clinical or non-clinical. I do think that we're benefiting from trends that are much bigger than us, we being the digital therapeutics industry. Um, just because of what's what COVID did to work culture, um, you know, the impact that's had on on how employers want to to provide for their employees health benefits, especially around mental health. There's a there's a really strong hunger for scalable mental health solutions right now. And the right digital therapeutic can definitely be in the right place at the right time with that. And I mean, I think that comes back to the pandemic in a big way. Yeah, it's 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 actually, I mean, interesting, um, you know, to think of the word benefited, uh, but I agree with you, right? On one side, everything snapped online. So the the virtual care, tele everything just became the norm on one side, right? It, it sped up the learning curve for, you know, across the board. Interestingly enough, while, you know, the virtual first approach, still here, still here to stay, will continue growing. What we've seen actually, interestingly enough, again, back to the human in the loop, um, that connection that be- during the pandemic we were missing, right? We're missing that humane connection. Um, it's still back, right? And uh, with Advent, with AI technologies and chat GPT, um, we're we're seeing firsthand people coming and asking the coaches, for example, are you a bot or a human, right? Uh, and as soon as they actually find out it's a human, um, and you know, as we do quality management and reviews, um, we're seeing people almost happy to see another individual on the other line and not just talking to chatbot. So high tech, high touch, um, yeah. you know, that impact of over indexing on technology. Um, and and helping individuals just get better along the way. So I think the DTX industry is here. I think it will stay. Will it be called digital therapeutic industry in 10, 10 years? Probably not, um, but, but it'll just be a therapy um, along with molecular and, and other modalities. Another stakeholder that was surprisingly well-represented, I thought, was the providers. Um, a lot of conversation about selling into, um, you know, hospitals, uh, but a lot of that conversation came down to EHR integration, how important it still is. And, and that was almost that was almost weird for me to hear just because I, I it's the same conversation I was having. I was hearing at these conferences 10 years ago when I was working for Moby Health News. You know, you've got to integrate with EHRs. Oh, but EHRs suck. They're hard to integrate with and, and they're hard to work with. Um, but that's what physicians care about and workflow. Uh, I didn't hear anything really new there, so I don't know how much we need to sit here talking about it. But um, any any thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I might my two senses. Unfortunately, we'll still be talking about this decade later as well. I it, it, there, there's no one size fits all. Um, I think there will continue being no matter what the protocols are, you know, fire other exchange ways. There will continue being a proprietary way of exchanging data as well. Um, I think, uh, especially with the advent of learning models, I think the data that um, com- virtual care companies and others are collecting think of that as a very proprietary to themselves. So why share this? Those are the discussions that I'm hearing. Um, as well. So I, I just, I, I fear for the sake of the patients and the usability and this disconnected way of accessing our own health um, and health data will continue being an obstacle going forward. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think for the listeners that do know me, I'm a very positive guy um, on this one. I'm, I'm still unfortunately betting on, on the EMR companies to consistently stay difficult to integrate with. So I would say the number two thing that was discussed after paratherapeutics was Achille Interactive and their decision to move away from prescription digital therapeutics into an over-the-counter model uh, in their Endeavor product for ADHD. Um, there were a lot of people throwing shade, a lot of people saying it's never going to work as a sustainable business model, and a lot of folks from Achille on stage. I, they had three different people there who who were on stage in, in major ways. Um, and and they were, I mean, eager to hear anything Eddie said at that final panel because I missed that one. But um, 
you know, they seemed quite bullish on it, in, in, at least, you know, in the short term. Uh, what are your thoughts about Achilles specifically and more generally about this over-the-counter route, this direct-to-consumer route? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll back up, and I think, you know, uh, Eddie clarified it um, probably about a, you know, a week before the event. Um, um, Martin from um, Eversana wrote a long post and many others. I think Michael Pace commented on this. OTC does not equal DTC, period, right? So I think many individuals out there are assuming that it's just yet another, you know, app in the app store downloaded and OTC equals DTC. That's not the case, right? Um, And so FDA is still involved and you got to get the OTC label. Um, and, and so this is not as simple as creating a game, um, as Akili has done, putting it in the app store, getting it accepted, and then charging anywhere between 10 to $25 or whatever that might be. Um, so that's one clarification that if the folks listening to this have not heard this before, I'm not going to get into the whole process of getting to the OTC, uh, mark, but that's just, again, the reality. So, um, now as far as, um, you know, specifically your question on Achille and broader OTC. Um, I'm actually very much a proponent, and I think part of that is the discussion around, um, you know, similar things like about the reimbursement and the lack thereof and the time it takes um, and, 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 and the consumerism of healthcare. And if I'm a parent, and again, for full transparency, um, for my younger daughter, we purchased uh, we purchased the uh, the Achilles OT, the Endeavor Endeavor OTC right. Um, it is quote unquote safe right. Um, it is something downloadable. It's a hundred and change for the year in the App Store. And the worst case scenario is that my daughter plays a game right. And I think part of this is looking and understanding other non molecular options especially for the disease types that some of these safe prescription uh, therapeutics have been developed and evidence have been gathered. Now, you know, what's the leaky funnel, right? We do know the direct-to-consumer, you know, advertising model, you spend X to acquire customer, the retention rates. And so while, again, from a purely label perspective, OTC does not equal DTC, some of the dynamics around acquisition, cost cost of acquisition of consumer do play in hand. And so this will be the interesting piece to watch how a company such as Achille and others going to space can do equivalent or better than a good DTC product in the app store, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, all, all those are, are really good points. Um, and and uh, I, I like that distinction between OTC and, and DTC. And, and, uh, It'd be eager to hear how, you know, how your experience with it is as a parent. Um, I actually downloaded it myself. I haven't paid for it yet, um, but uh, but I do have ADHD and I am kind of intrigued about <laughs> sort of experiencing some of this firsthand. So I'm, I'm thinking about giving it a try. So first of all, because, um, you know peripherally in the industry, right? At least with a podcast um, and, and our, you know, your coach clients are some of the DTX companies out there. Uh, I have a somewhat of a vested interest to even get feedback. So one of the key things when, when my daughter down, I'm like, jot down everything so we could pass on the feedback, right? Because I think as entrepreneurs, we, we love feedback. Um, and I think, uh, don't quote me, but I think Eddie mentioned something like 125,000 downloads. I don't know the time frame. Um, you know, I think you can listen to his interim update, um, I think end of September, where they, they disclose some of the numbers. Um, I Look, uh, th- this takes commitment also, right? And I think that's part of the challenge around behavior change and things that, um, you know, yes, taking a pill might be a quicker way. Uh, but it is about, uh, again, these scientifically proven and validated digital therapies that do take time and adherence to them, just like to the drug, um, and changing a behavior. So a little too early to tell. I mean, it's been about a month. Um, all I know is that she is enjoying the game. I mean, she's not a gamer, but she's enjoying the game. Um, and we'll keep uh, the listeners posted. So last thing I want to talk about, and then if you've got more, by all means, but there was so many, so much conversation about evidence generation and commercial strategy and about the need for alignment between evidence generation and commercial strategy. The notion that, you know, if, 
you need to know very early on if you're generating evidence for the FDA, if you're generating evidence for payers, if you're generating evidence for a pharma partner, uh, because they're all going to want, you know, slightly different things. And evidence generation takes a lot of time and it's not nimble. Uh, it's it's maybe more nimble for a digital therapeutic than it is for a drug, but uh, you know that these these processes are are involved. So there's this tension between right now you have a lot of optionality in how you are going to develop and commercialize your digital therapeutics, but you have to exercise those options pretty early on. <laughs> um, and and that came up a lot. I mean, I don't think anybody argued with that. Uh, I and that came up from a lot of people who sort of ought to know who have been around the block, either digital therapeutics makers themselves or representatives from the FDA, um, uh, a, a lawyer who, who works with companies and helps them through the regulation and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, kind of peeling the onion a bit on, on, that was a lot. Um, I think, uh, I hate to say this for the listeners, there is no silver bullet, right? Uh, these are some tough decisions that entrepreneurs or let's call it even, you know, companies that have been around the block have to make. At the end of the day, if you're treating a human being and it is and carries a treatment label, right? Not a wellness, but a treatment label, this has to go through rigorous research and scientific validation, period, right? Now, um, the question becomes, and I think this is the panel that I that I hosted with Eliane from Twill, uh, Adriano uh, from ZS, uh, and Perry, I believe from Yale, um, who run trials. This was part of the discussion that yes, there needs to be an adjustment, but I don't know if anybody knows what that right adjustment is. Right? Yes, on one side you got to move quicker. But there is an ethics board uh, for good for for good reason, right? We're talking about patient data. We're talking about treating. Um, I I I wish I had the silver bullet in many of the discussions, but I don't. Um, I think this is something that good entrepreneurs are figuring out how to do, you know, effectively, uh, ethically, scalably, and as quickly as possible. Um, I don't know if anybody who can roll something out, uh, you know, completely scientifically proven and validated in a year, right, um, to save the runway. It's just, it's it's also, um, which is part of the reason why I think we've seen some entrepreneurs go that wellness route to gather the data, to, um, you know, to ask the right questions, to observe it. Um, and then at the end of the day, I always say from a technological perspective, everything is possible as long as you have time and money, right? So... Um, which is, you know, there's scarcity in both of those, unfortunately. So any other thoughts, anything else, you know, that I, I, you think I've left out maybe, (laughs) or that you heard? No. So I think we've covered sort of the key kind of takeaways. Uh, I think everything that we've heard, I just, I, I, I do want to urge, uh, the listeners that, you know, it, it is very, very, very easy to kind of start singing doom and gloom. Um, you know, what we started doing in the DTX podcast with the last episode, for example, is hearing real live patient stories of using these digital therapies that are actually helping patients, right? Um, and, and that's what I would love for the listeners to focus on. These digital technologies do work. Uh, they will find a place, and I will actually use, uh, you know, uh, Ed Cox's uh, comment, and I'll paraphrase it, that... I agree with him. A decade from now, somebody who is, you know, seven years old today or eight years old or whatever the the young age will say, what? This modality was even being argued about 10 years ago? So I think they're here. They will stay. The models will change. The funding will change. The unit economics will change, uh, but it'll be here in a decade. So that's, you know, maybe more of a, my optimism comes through here, uh, but I just wanted to leave the listeners with that note. Absolutely. And, you know, let, let's let do take a minute for cross-promotion because I know we're going to be dropping this in your feed too, Eugene. Uh, so if if Eugene's listeners are, are interested in a little more of a broader take on the pharma industry, we'd love to have you uh, check out the Pharma Forum podcast. And if uh, my listeners are interested in going way deeper on this DTX space <laughs> um, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, please do give a, give a subscribe to Eugene's podcast, the DTX podcast. It's a great it's very uh, casual, conversational. Uh, I've I've been on it 
Uh, and uh, it's it's really doing good work uh, in connecting and covering this industry. Jonah, thank you very much. And uh, as, as always, a tide raises all boats, right? We're all trying to improve uh, patient outcomes and help, uh, you know, help human beings out there. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, really coming through at the last minute to help me uh, bring some of the insights from this show uh, out to the world more broadly in a timely manner. Thank you for the invite, and you know I always enjoy it. That concludes this episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find more information about this episode, including a download link and information about other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com slash podcast. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher, and Podme, where you can find and subscribe by searching for Pharma Forum. And don't forget to visit our website where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins and to follow us on Twitter at at PharmaForum. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.